I want to discuss the basics of interpretation. We are going to use Haskell as the meta language, that is, for implementation of the interpreters, and we are going to interpret quite different object languages. So we start with a very simple expression language. Um, I call it BTL for basic tuple language, where tuple refers to Pierce's textbook types in programming languages. Essentially, it's really very simple expression language. So it has predecessor, successor, zero for natural numbers. It has true and false for booleans. It has some test is zero to check whether the number is zero or not. And it has a conditional one if with a condition and a then and an else branch. So this is how we imagine to use the interpreter at the Haskell prompt. So we evaluate a certain expression and interpretation either succeeds, and in this case, uh, for example, the expression evaluates to zero, or maybe interpretation also fails, uh, because in this example, well, we cannot quite compute the predecessor of the Boolean value true. So therefore, we have an exception here. So let's understand why this expression evaluates to zero here. So well, in here we have a conditional, and so the condition is, is zero, zero? Well, that's obviously true. So this means we are going to select the then branch, suck zero. So, so far the result is one. Now we compute pred of one, which is obviously zero. Overall, an interpreter is just a meter program which executes or evaluates object programs or program phrases, and in this case, we just evaluate expressions. So here's an informal baseline for interpreting the expressions of the BTL language. Well, of course, we expect to evaluate true as a syntactical construct to true as the Boolean value, and likewise false should be evaluated to false, and zero should be evaluated to zero, and the successor for some expression E should evaluate to n plus one, uh, assuming that E can be evaluated to some natural number or integer n. And for predecessor, well, we uh, have sort of the opposite situation. We subtract one, except that we have the special case that when we have um, zero, then we say that uh, the predecessor of zero is also zero. The test for E evaluates to a Boolean, depending on whether uh, E uh, evaluates to zero or not, and the conditional, well, evaluates like a normal conditional depending on the uh, value of the first position E0, we either select E1 or E2. Now, this informal baseline is easily implemented in an actual interpreter, so what we need here is we need a special type value, which is a sum over int and bool, because some expressions might result in an int, other expressions might result in a bool. So our interpreter is a function from expr to value. And then the first three cases are very straightforward. These are the constant cases. So true is mapped to true, false is mapped to false, zero is mapped to zero. And of course, we always have to pick the right uh, side of the sum. So, And for suck and pred, we have some recursion going on here. So we need to compute also the uh, value for uh, the sub-expression e, and we perform pattern matching here, like with left n equals, or here also left n equals, because we need to enforce that the sub-expression evaluates to a number, and then here we indeed construct a successor, and here we check whether uh, the intermediate result n is um, zero or not. If it's zero, then well, we keep it, and if it's uh, not zero, let's say if it's greater than zero, then uh, well, we subtract one. This is the is zero test. Well, we essentially really just check whether the expression e evaluates to a number n that equals zero, and again, pattern matching is involved, and this is how we deal with a conditional. So the conditional of BTL is essentially translated into a conditional of the host language, that is Haskell. 
only that we have to perform some uh, pattern matching here for the condition part. So that's it. So let's look at the next language. So this is going to be a very simple imperative language. Uh, let's say a C-like imperative language. And up here in the comment, uh, we also show the program for Euclidean division in some assumed concrete C-like syntax. So this is really Euclidean division. So we assume that we divide x by y and that q is going to be the quotient and r is going to be the remainder. And we use this kind of subtraction based method to in fact compute q and r. Down here we have the abstract syntactic representation of the very same program. So you see, for example, here's the while loop from up here. And in the body we have these assignments to R and Q, just like here. So this is just straightforward uh, representation of the object program. And so when we invoke the interpreter, uh, we also pass in some what we call a store, that is some initial verbal assignment, because we somehow need to pass the arguments X and Y to the program. They are not set up here, so we pass them as the store. And so what we say essentially is that x is going to be 13 and y is going to be 4. And of course, by interpretation of the program, we get that the quotient for 13 and 4 is 3 with a remainder 2. So this is interesting because interpretation involves a verbal assignment or a store, which is changed along the execution, uh, say, along interpretation. So here's the actual interpreter. We use the same kind of value type as before, because values are either ints, well, previously we had natural numbers effectively, now we really just use ints, or they are bools. And a store is just a mapping from strings, or the variable names, to values, to variable values. The function execute uh, describes how statements are executed, that is, how they are mapped to transformations on stores. Down here we have the evaluate function, which describes how expressions are essentially mapped to values while possibly observing stores, because we may have verbals within the expressions. All right, so let's just look at some of these cases in detail. Well, the empty statement called skip here uh, just takes the store and returns it as is. When we have an assignment, um, for the variable x on the left hand side and some expression e on the right hand side. What we do is, of course, we evaluate the right hand side expression and then we insert or modify the store m so that it assumes the value for e uh, on the position x. Sequential composition is essentially just function composition. So we first apply one store transformation for S1, and then we apply store transformation for S2. Again, the if statement is essentially translated into the if expression of our host language. And the while statement is dealt with in a clever way by um, expanding the while statement essentially in an if statement, which maybe executes the body once and then executes again the entire while statement. Or if the condition fails right from the start, then we just are done. So the uh, cases for expression evaluation, maybe we just skip them. There's also some tedious details here, uh, like we also need to translate unary and binary operation symbols from the syntax of the imperative language to appropriate operations of the Haskell language. So this is maybe straightforward enough to skip it here. So another language we want to consider, this is a functional language, again also very very simple functional language, and the concrete syntax shown up here in the comment uh, makes us think that this could be a Haskell subset. So we want to basically interpret uh, a main expression which invokes the factorial function. So the factorial function is programmed here in a recursive fashion, just uh, proper Haskell style, so if the argument equals 0, then we return 1, otherwise we multiply the argument x with the factorial of the predecessor of x. And again, down here, this is just the abstract syntactical representation of that very program. 
So if we evaluate this program here, including its main expression, which applies the factorial function to 5, then of course we are prepared to um, get the result 120, because the factorial of 5 is 120. Um, this interpreter here is going to be special insofar that it involves what we call environments. So environments, is, that's, that's essentially about data structures to be passed into the interpretation of program phrases. They are just sort of providing context for interpretation. So as opposed to stores that we had in the previous case, stores are going to be changed along interpretation. All right, so here's the interpreter for the functional language at hand. Again, value is defined as, as before, and the environment type is in fact defined exactly in the same way as the store type for the imperative language, except that we are going to use environments in a different way. So we have like a top level function here, which takes an entire program, including a main expression, and uh, we are supposed to return a value. So the real work is going on in this uh, function f here, which takes an arbitrary expression and an environment uh, mapping function arguments to actual values to compute a value. So we initialize the environment up here for the main expression. We initialize it as the empty environment because obviously no variables are yet bound. So let's go through all these cases one by one. An int const is evaluated to the corresponding int. A bool const is evaluated to the corresponding bool. When we have an argument access, presumably within the body of a function that we evaluate, well, then the argument must be looked up from the environment n. Again, the if expression of the functional language here is mapped to the if construct of the host language. And when we have unary and binary expressions, we essentially just recurse into the sub-expressions with f here, and then we assume some interpretation function uop and bop for translating the, um, the object languages constructs into Haskell constructs, that is, operations on ints and bools. The most interesting case here for this interpreter is the case for function application. So we apply a certain function x to a certain list of um, function arguments, es. And so what we do here is we construct a new environment for evaluation of the body of the function. So of course we first have to also look up the function from the list of functions. And in this manner, we get a list of the formal arguments, that is, um, names of arguments, and we get a body indeed. And then what we do here is, we now also need to evaluate all the uh, actual arguments, um, I mean, these expressions ES, by applying F and the pre-existing environment M to it. By this, we get some values. And then we need to zip together the formal arguments, say the names, with the actual arguments, I mean the values thereof. And by this, we compute a new environment, which indeed we use here in evaluating the body. Okay, one more interpreter. So this time we're going to look at a finite state machine language. Here's a graphical uh, illustration. This is a finite state machine for a turnstile as used in a, a metro system. So the turnstile may be locked or if we insert a ticket it could be unlocked. So then we can pass through and then it gets locked again. If we still try to pass through after it's locked, well then we end up in an exceptional state and so on and so forth. And along these transitions we may also have actions like that the ticket is collected or that an alarm is triggered. And we do have events like that the ticket is inserted or that one, someone tries to pass and so on and so forth. Again, we have a simple abstract syntactical representation for this sort of finite state machines. So an FSM is a list of state declarations 
for each state we have its name and the indication as to whether this is the initial state or not. And then we have a list of transitions uh, which have in common that the state at hand is the source state of the transition. Okay, And this is how we expect to interpret or to use the final state machine. So we are supposed to provide some input that is a list of events to um, trigger some transitions and uh, we probably should see a certain output that is certain actions being ex executed along the transitions. So uh, for example here by inserting a ticket we would trigger the output collect and so on. And this is how we would invoke the interpreter so we would indeed apply the interpreter um, to the turnstile FSM we provide a sample out input and we check that the actual output equals the expected output. So what's special about this sort of language here is that interpretation naturally would commence in stepwise manner, I mean transition by transition, rather than in a recursive manner where we uh, fully evaluate some expression. Also this language is special insofar that it's obviously not a programming language, but it's rather what we call a domain-specific modeling language and it happens to be executable nevertheless. So here's the interpreter for FSML and let's not get lost too much in details, let's just get an overall idea of how the interpreter works. I mean at the top basically we see the stepwise interpretation behavior because we use a fold over the list of events uh, serving as the input of the interpreter, right? So we fold transition by transition over the events XS. And of course we start from the initial state, so here we use a list comprehension to look up hopefully the only, the one and only state that is marked as initial. And make transition is the function that indeed makes the transition and it does so by looking up with get transition uh, the transition that is applicable for the uh, current state and for the event at hand. And so we may extend the output here um, depending on whether the transition provides an action or not. And we always uh, return a new target state. And again we use a list comprehension to look up the transition, if any, that uh, belongs to a certain source state to a given event. So that's it. That was an informal introduction to the topic of interpreters. I've shown you a bunch of interpreters. So all the code on the slides is also available in the YAS repository. And then I also recommend the Software Languages book which discusses interpretation in more detail. And it also gets into formal semantics, say operational and denotational semantics, uh, still, with these formal semantics, we can also uh, derive interpreters again, but then in a more systematic manner than shown today. Thank you.